Number 10, grave robbing. Probably the most infamous crime of the time and today, really. The ancient Egyptians were many things, and that included vain. There's a reason why they got Elizabeth Taylor to play Cleopatra. It all makes sense. The pharaohs of Egypt were buried with immeasurable amounts of treasures. Gold, gems, jewels, swords, cats, dogs, just about everything but the kitchen sink. Once the tombs were sealed, the treasure was also sealed in there forever, or so they thought. That was until some crafty thieves broke into the tombs and slipped away with the loot. When a lot of Egypt was being discovered in the 1920s, it was unsure if the loot had been taken 10 years ago or 1,000 years ago. There's not really a way to know. And yes, it still happens to this day, and yes, it's awful. Leave it in there, it belongs to them, please. No more, no, no loot, Tim. Don't go loot, Tim, please. Number 9. Bribery Given that Egypt was one of the greatest civilizations the ancient world ever saw, it makes sense that they had it all. Currency, law, order. However, sometimes, well, sometimes these things just don't mix. Ever seen Better Call Saul? Yeah, exactly. They had a good system for the time and it was fairly concrete. However, like concrete over time, there's little tiny cracks that form, aka bribery. Oftentimes when facing serious charges against the pharaoh, there was an option to opt out of your sentence, just open your wallet and dish out some cash. This has worked in ancient Egypt, medieval Europe, 1920s America, and today. Say what you will, but the almighty dollar does have buying power. Number eight. Unaliving. If women of the evening partake in the world's oldest profession every night, then unaliving is the second thing we ever did. It's not really a profession, but it's we've been doing it for a long time. It's pretty sad, but it's true. Sure, it's always been frowned upon, but today we have a lot of rules, laws, and regulations regarding said rules, laws, and regulations about unaliving. It's bad. Don't do it. It was unfortunately more common than we think back in the day, especially amongst royals in ancient Egypt frothing at the mouth for the throne. But this is something that could have happened to anyone. Plus, in a time before CSI and guys throwing off their glasses to make very obvious low-hanging fruit jokes, well, if you didn't see the crime, then you probably wouldn't catch the crook. So people kind of just got away with it sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. Number seven, assassination. Related to my last point, nothing is true, everything is permitted. The creed of the assassins in one of my favorite video game franchises, at least up until they did Pirates. After that, it's... I was all kind of downhill after that. Well, despite the inaccuracies of the Assassin's Creed series has, like falling from great heights into bales of hay, the first known assassins just may have started in Rome and Egypt. More likely Egypt than spread to Rome, actually. Like a Sith, a lot of these early assassinations were for revenge, personal ambition, power lust, especially in the pursuit of success. Some were even part of larger plans. Now, it's one thing to be violent, sure, but to organize the destruction of a dynasty through the means of your knife, well, it's amazing what a couple inches of steel can accomplish. Who goes there? Someone's knocking on the door? We're good, okay, anyway, sorry. Number six, treason. Law and order in Egypt were associated with something called Mahat. I believe that's how you say it, which refers to truth and justice within society. Like I said before, great idea, great start, but more often than not, the ancient Egyptians had to fight off a lot of treason and corruption, uh, more than they like to admit it. Like when King Ramsay III chose the heir to his throne, and uh, well, it wasn't who his wife had picked out, so there was going to be problems. There was a lot of wives, sons, and, and breeding, there's, con there's confusing lines. So in order to get what she wanted, she was going to stab him in the back. Literally. Well, her plot was unfoiled and her and all the conspirators were immediately unalived as punishment. There wasn't even a burial service as they were all thrown in the river afterwards. No amount of money or bribery could save them there. Number five, thigh or leg. Ever sit down at the holiday dinner table and your uncle's cutting the turkey and says, are you a thigh man or are you a leg man? <laughs> Except he says the same thing every Christmas and you can't wait for him to say it because that means you're another second closer to not being there. Anxiety is a heck of a thing, man. I don't have anxiety that bad. I'm just trying to relate to some of the people out there. I feel like I've been there with you. I don't know. Well, this was no Christmas and this certainly was no turkey, but people were talking about here. Yeah, we're talking about people. When someone was found to have done a serious enough crime, but not serious enough to be unalived, the authorities met in the middle by taking a leg. Oh, God, that's awful. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, I guess it's not that bad. You, you lose a leg and you move on. But imagine being held down and someone hacking your leg off with a bronze tool because steel doesn't exist yet. Oh, it's awful. Awful. No good. No painkillers. Number four, homework. 
Homework, homework, homework. Homework, homework. Love it or hate it. Well, I actually hate it, and so did most of my friends. Some say it's needed in a modern world to teach efficiently. Some argue it doesn't do anything at all. I did my homework 90% of the time, believe it or not. And I know some, some of you are going to comment and say, oh, Chetty, no, you didn't. I did. I really did. But when I didn't, I would usually come in and charm my way out of it. Hi, Mrs. Middleton. You look great today. You're the best. It worked most of the time. What can I say? Usually on, the, usually on the female teachers, it didn't work on the male teachers so. though. But the worst that would have happened is that I would lose a percent off my grade here or there, but I just make it up back on the test, no problem. Well, scribes in ancient Egypt weren't so lucky. They were very important as they were literally the writers of the time. They, they described the history, it's pretty cool actually. However, if they chose to stay up all night and play Call of Duty like I did, well, their punishment was a more of the violent physical variety and not so much the stern talking to or I'm going to phone your mother variety. My mom didn't care. Number three, caning. Another creative punishment for crimes was caning of the feet, which is actually arguably the worst thing on this list. Since, you know, we use feet every time we walk or do something, you're gonna need a spa treatment after this one. A very simple process, the person is strapped down, feet exposed, a governing official then takes as many lashes to the feet as required. Painful, humiliating, and possibly dangerous. Cuts could lead to infection as we're walking around in heat, sweat, and well, some folks, if you're poor enough, just didn't have shoes. The worst I ever got was a couple minutes in the timeout corner, except that my mom felt bad because I looked really cute and I was sad, and everything was fine. No spanking required. I was a good boy, I promise. There's some people don't think I was a good boy, but I really was a good boy. Number two, barbecue. I feel like the moment humans discovered fire, well, that fire hurts, we wanted to throw everything in it and see what happens. Now, I jokingly call this segment barbecue, but that's because it's really horrible. Famously, a group of rebels in ancient Egypt were immolated after trying to overthrow the pharaoh. Where after the barbecue from hell had finished, the pharaoh used these rebels as human torches. I, that's, oh, wow, okay. All Fantastic Four jokes aside, it was horrible, smelly, and cruel. Don't ever do this, please. Number one, adultery. Surprisingly, one of the most punishable crimes in ancient Egypt was being unfaithful, partly related to the lifestyle of Mahat and being truthful and just. It really makes sense. Just be a good boy. It makes a lot of sense, but some people don't follow that. The whole thing is bizarre because, well, no one really followed it, especially the royals. I mean, they had kids with their sisters and brothers and cousins and, and others and all, uh, just, it's messy. However, some folks did find themselves caught in this law, and when they did, they could succumb to anything on this list. For women, it was most likely the torch. For men, it was impalement and then being tossed into the river because, you know. Better keep those love notes to yourself, folks. Not worth getting burned over. It's it's not worth it. Just keep it to yourself. Number 10, Mary the First. So this is a ruler who could have reserved a place in common history as the first woman ever to be, you know, the Queen of England. Instead, she is mostly remembered as B-L-O-O-D-Y Mary, a name she acquired because of her staunch and violent opposition to the Reformation. Look, the interwebs don't like the B word, so I had to spell it out. So I'm hoping you figured out what I was trying to say. The most controversial part of her reign was her religious policy. Despite promises a month into her rise to the throne that she would not pursue forced conversion of Protestants, Mary had leading Protestant churchmen imprisoned. She sought to reaffirm papal jurisdiction over England, and when the deal with Rome succeeded, the heresy acts were reinstated, which allowed for the burning of heretics. This sent a wave of fear through England, and around 800 Protestant nobles immediately fled the country. I wonder why. In February of 1555, well, um, the uh, executions began. Protestant Archbishop Thomas Cranmer was forced to watch the bishops Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer being burned at the stake. Cranmer repented his Protestant faith and technically, under law, he should have been absolved as a repentant, but Mary refused to accept his absolution and had him burned at the stake as well just to, you know, Set an example, or for funsies. By the end of her terror, Mary had almost 300 people executed, most of them by burning at the stake simply for the crime of being Protestant. Her reign was relatively short, lasting a little over five years, since she passed in 1558 from either ovarian cysts or ovarian cancer and was succeeded by Elizabeth I. Number nine, Wu Zetian. 
Look, I know I said in the title of today that I'd be talking about evil queens, but I support all women's wrongs. And rulers in other countries tend to have different titles to their equivalent of queens. So Wu was born to a relatively wealthy family and had extremely progressive parents, becoming well versed in a wide range of subjects including writing, music, literature, and perhaps most importantly, politics and governmental affairs. By the age of 14, Wu was summoned to the imperial palace to become a concubine of Emperor Taizong. After his passing, the newly anointed Emperor Li Zi, the youngest son of the late emperor, who became Emperor Gaozong, brought Wu to the imperial court to be his own concubine. I'm not going to unpack that. In 654, Wu bore a daughter, but shortly after the birth, it passed, with evidence showing um, strangulation. So Wu accused Empress Wang of the death, and Wang lost favor with the emperor. The most popular theory is that Wu actually uh, did the act to her own daughter. So thereafter, the emperor conferred with his chancellors, and despite opposition, demoted Wang, having her imprisoned, and promoted Wu to empress. Later on, the emperor considered having Wang released, but Wu had her executed upon hearing this, because, you know, can't have any witnesses. Upon her accession to the throne, Wu began targeting officials who had opposed her rise to power, having them arrested and imprisoned, exiled, forced to take their own lives, or or executed. In 664, she accused several officials of witchcraft and had them uh, executed as well, and their families became slaves within the imperial palace. In another incident, she killed her niece with poison, accused two others of the death, and executed them. She eventually passed after repeated bouts with illness, so nothing nefarious there. Number 8, Isabella of Castile. So when Isabella was born on the 22nd of April in 1451, there was little chance she would ever become monarch of Castile, as she was very far removed from the direct royal lineage. War, politics, and subterfuge intervened, however, and for many years, the Kingdom of Spain was in turmoil, suffering from civil wars and uh, a lot of chaos. To quell one of the rebellions, the hand of Isabella was promised to the commoner, Pedro Duran Acuna Pacheco, but on his way to her, he suddenly fell ill and, um, passed. Now, this immensely fortuitous event for Isabella cemented her devotion to her faith, since she didn't exactly want to marry a commoner and prayed for divine intervention. Her marriage to Ferdinand, heir to the thrones of Castile and Aragon, cemented her future power. After the death of the King of Castile, the throne was given to Isabella. Her cruelty is recognized in the treatment of non-Christians, which led to the formation of the Spanish Inquisition, known for its extreme brutality and torture of mostly Jewish and Muslim folks. Isabella waged war on the Kingdom of Granada, the last Muslim kingdom in Spain, and the last piece to fall in the Spanish Reconquista. While some may see it as the liberation of Spain, for many others, it was open genocide. By the time Granada was annexed, 100,000 Muslims were either dead or enslaved. Number 7, Catherine de' Medici. I'm chuckling, but I'm glad my obsession with rain in high school is about to come in handy. So serving as the Queen of France from 1547 to 1559, Catherine had enormous political sway over her sons, the French kings Francis II, Charles IX, and Henry III. They reigned through the French wars of religion and faced problems with a group of Calvinist Protestants called the Huguenots. It is widely believed by historians that Catherine attempted to have their leader, Gaspard II de Calais, assassinated. The attempt failed, and fearing retaliation from the most powerful folks in power, Catherine planned to kill them all before they could take action. The result was the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which resulted in the deaths of between, oh, 5,000 to 30,000 Huguenots. Number 6, Lady Elizabeth Bathory. Born in 1560 on a family estate in royal Hungary, Elizabeth was of noble lineage and privileged with education, wealth, and a lofty social rank. Her first taste of the morbidly bizarre was introduced to her during the early years of her life when she suffered seizures which might have been epilepsy. Treatment at the time for such bouts included feeding the patient human redness and bits of skull from a non-sufferer. She bore witness to brutal punishments and executions carried out by her father's officers and was influenced by family members involved with Satanism and witchcraft. When she was barely in the double digits of age, Elizabeth was engaged to Count Ferenc Nadasi, who she later married. Her husband spent much of his time away from home fighting the Ottomans, leaving Elizabeth to run the estate. Her Satanism became more pronounced as time wore on, and upon the death of her husband in 1601, her vicious crimes escalated. Most of her victims were girls around the age of the time she got married, and were usually the daughters of lesser gentry who had been sent to court to learn etiquette. Her favorite punishment methods including using pins to stick under her victims' fingernails and covering her victims in honey and leaving them out to be eaten by ants and other insects. Other methods included whipping her victims with nettles and frequently burning body parts, especially genitalia. After burning her victims, she would dump them in icy water. Many of them uh, were punished to the point of death, some of whom were buried in unmarked locations, and some sources even claim she engaged in people munching. 
making that her darkest secret. Elizabeth and a few of her servants were eventually arrested in 1610, and her accomplices were put on trial in 1611. With over 300 witness accounts and numerous testimonials, a guilty verdict was assured. A servant girl who claims to have seen evidence in Elizabeth's private books stated that her victims were around 650 folks. The accomplices were sentenced to death, and Elizabeth was confined to a bricked up room with slits for air and delivery of food. She was found dead a couple years later. Number 5. Marie Antoinette so France's queen between 1774 and 1792 was Marie Antoinette, who was you know, the last queen before the French Revolution. She had quite the reputation for splurging on expensive things and found herself in quite a few scandals. One in particular was the affair of the diamond necklace. So Countess de Lamotte, a young lady, pretended to be the queen's friend and entered the French court in 1785. She fooled a high society member into believing that Antoinette loved him. She even hired a buy selling worker and disguised her as the queen and convinced the man that uh, Marie wanted to purchase a diamond necklace. The jewelry cost around 1,600,000 livres then, which is almost $12 million today. The money was never paid, and the queen had no clue about what had taken place, but even though she was innocent, the public still despised her. Granted, she's mostly known for her infamous dialogue. When French subjects could not afford bread, she said, let them eat cake, which fueled the French Revolution and ultimately led to her um, execution. Number 4. Queen of Castile So Juana la Loca was the Queen of Castile from 1504 to 1516, and she suffered from various mental disorders. After her husband passed in 1506, her father buried his body. However, Juana used to open the tomb and caress her husband's dead body, and ultimately she ordered the body dug out and kissed her husband's feet. Additionally, she would carry his coffin everywhere with her, and actually kept it under her bed. Years later though, she eventually allowed his burial outside her window. Look, I just keep weird dolls under my bed. Number 3. Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg Maria Eleonora, born on November 11th of 1599, passing eventually on March 28th of 1655, held the title of Queen of Sweden from 1620 to 1632 as the wife of King Gustav II Adolf. Coming from a noble German family, she belonged to the prestigious house of I'm not even going to try and say that. However, when Maria and Gustav gave birth to a girl with a genetic condition causing excessive hair growth, Maria was deeply shocked. The unexpected appearance of her daughter, combined with uh, societal beauty expectations, pushed Maria to her limits. She considered her daughter ugly and refused to care for what she perceived as a monstrous creature. When Gustav died when Christina was only um, this many years old, Maria blamed her for his death. For over a year, Maria subjected Christina to very harsh punishment, confining her to blacked out, darkened rooms to mourn her father in solitude for very extended periods, even placing her father's open casket in Christina's room and demanding she sleep next to it, which that's way too morbid, even by my standards. Maria's mental state deteriorated, eventually leading to Christina's removal from her custody. So thank goodness for Christina. Number two is Sixty the Dragon Lady. So the story of her rise to power is a remarkable one. Born at a time when Chinese women were politically invisible, this lady managed to acquire enormous political influence by exploiting her position as a royal concubine, engaging in court intrigues and manipulating those around her. By the end of the 1860s, she had become the most powerful individual in China. Her will and her reach even exceeded two male emperors, who she frequently bypassed or overruled. Now, she was originally born Lan Kuo in 1835, the daughter of a minor Manchu official, and at age 15, she was selected as a potential concubine for the emperor and relocated to the Forbidden City. She was elevated to the status of concubine officially by age 18, eventually giving birth to the emperor's only son, Zhechun, a feat that earned her another promotion in the palace hierarchy. The emperor died in 1861, and shortly after the disastrous Second Opium War, left the throne to his only son. So as the mother of the reigning emperor, Sixi was given the courtesy title Dowager Empress. So by this point, the empress had become quite adept at manipulation, palace intrigues, and power games. Through forged evidence and false testimony, she engineered the arrest of the eight ministers, three of whom were later executed. With the Regency Council gone, the empress became the de facto regent for the duration of her son's reign, until his early death from smallpox in 1875. The empress was instrumental in the succession, choosing her young nephew Zetian, who was crowned as emperor. So once again, this dowager empress acted as regent to the infant emperor, this time in a more formal capacity. Twelve years into the young emperor's reign, our empress moved to the summer palace in Beijing and surrounded by a network of informants and advisors doted on by loyalists and conservatives in the bureaucracy and military, she continued to exert enormous influence on appointments, policies, and matters of state. Stories of the empress's extravagance are prevalent, since it has been claimed that she regularly increased her personal and food allowances, uh, that she withdrew gold and silver 
silver from dwindling national reserves and spirited millions of pounds offshore into bank accounts in London. Other tales of her exorbitant spending include her decision to spend 10 million silver teals, uh, some set aside to rebuild the Chinese Navy, on the renovation of one of her palaces. Another rumor claims that 3,000 ebony boxes were needed to restore her jewelry collection. Number 1. Agrippina the Younger So Julia Agrippina, also referred to as Agrippina the Younger, was a Roman empress from 49 to 54 AD, the fourth wife and niece of Emperor Claudius and the mother of Nero. After the death of her first husband, Agrippina tried to make shameless advances to the future emperor Galba, who showed no interest in her and was devoted to his wife. On one occasion, Galba's mother-in-law gave Agrippina a public reprimand and a slap in the face before a whole bevy of married women. She was one of the most prominent women in the Julio-Claudian dynasty, functioning as a behind-the-scenes advisor in the affairs of the Roman state via you know, the powerful political ties. She maneuvered her son Nero into the line of succession, and Claudius became aware of her plotting, but died in 54 and it was rumored that Agrippina uh, poisoned him. She exerted a commanding influence in the early years of Nero's reign, but in 59 she was killed. Both ancient and modern sources describe Agrippina's personality as ruthless, ambitious, violent, and domineering. Number 10. The Oldest Profession in History Alrighty folks, we're kicking off today with a nice dose of internet no-no words, so bear with me here. If I sound convoluted, you know why. The Middle Ages in Europe witnessed a universal paradox of tolerance and condemnation with regards to the selling of one's body services. While well, technically a sin because it hinged on the act of fornication, this act was recognized by the church and others as necessary or a lesser evil. It was accepted as fact that young men would seek out sexual relations regardless of their options and thus this profession served to protect respectable townswomen from seduction or worse. In 1358, the Grand Council of Venice declared that this field was absolutely indispensable to the world. In general, declarations proclaiming the necessity of this line of work were not quite so enthusiastic. The church didn't hesitate to denounce it as morally wrong, but as St. Augustine explained, if you expel it from society, you will unsettle everything on account of lusts. So, you gotta have it. It just wasn't exactly ideal back then. Number 9. Hunting Witches Witch hunters often had their suspects stripped and publicly examined for signs of an unsightly blemish that witches were said to receive upon making their pact with Satan. Now, this devil's mark could supposedly change shape and color and was believed to be numb and insensitive to pain. And more often than not, women were both the witches and the witch hunters. And in these cases, it was easy for even the most minor physical imperfections to be labeled as the work of the devil himself. Moles, scars, birthmarks, sores, and tattoos could all qualify. So examiners rarely came up empty-handed. If found guilty, witches would be sent through a series of trials and punishments, starting with the scold bridle. Also known as a witch's bridle, a gossip's bridle, a brank's bridle, or simply branks, this was an instrument of public humiliation. It was an iron muzzle in an iron framework that enclosed the head, some exceptions were masks that depicted suffering, but not pleasant either way. Oh, you want me to elaborate? Alrighty, folks. A bridal bit or cur plate around 5 cm by 2.5 cm in size was slid into the mouth and pressed down on the top of the tongue, often with a spike on the tongue as a compress. Ouchie. It functioned to silence the wearer from speaking entirely and cause extreme pain and physiological trauma to scare and intimidate the wearer into submission. Now, this prevented speaking and resulted in many unpleasant side effects for the wearer, including excessive salivation and fatigue in the mouth. Seeing how I've always been a chatty cat, I would have been sentenced to this, and my jaw ah, hurts thinking about it. The wearer was then led around the town by a leash, and for extra humiliation, a bell could also be attached to drawing crowds. It was used as corporal punishment for other offenses, notably on female workhouse inmates, and the person to be punished was placed in a public place for additional humiliation, and who knows what else. I'm sure you can put two and two together. There's things I cannot say. Number eight, bathing in what now? Aptly named the B-L-O-O-D Countess, Elizabeth Bathory was a Hungarian noblewoman and was one of the most prolific female serial killers of her time. At the end of the 16th century and beginning of the 17th, she tormented and killed up to 650 young women at her castle in is what now known as Slovakia. The macabre nickname came from her apparent tendency to bathe in the redness of her victims as she believed it would help her maintain her youthful looking skin. I'll stick to my Epsom salts and the occasional bath fizzy. Oh, and my cleansing routines. Look, I swear my one cleanser from the ordinary might look suspicious, but it's not human redness. I just play a vampire professionally, folks. I'm not an actual one. Or maybe. Number 7. Serfdom In most Middle Ages communities, the king technically owned all the land in an area. He would lease it out to noble barons in exchange for an oath of their loyalty, and then these nobles had the freedom to govern their land and impose taxes as they pleased. Yeah, as you can expect, they were pretty brutal about it. This privilege for the few landed barons came at a great cost to the serfs. Now, This was the poor mass of people who had no land and no rights. They were essentially treated as slaves by the local nobles, and they toiled on the land and brutally worked six days a week from dawn until dusk. Per the feudal system, they were forced to produce crops, raise livestock, 
livestock and offer some value, you know, to pay their liege lord for the use of the land. And the grind never ended. If you were born into the lower class, it was extremely likely you would remain there for your entire life. There was no social mobility or opportunity to work through one's birth position. Instead, the poor, unwashed masses simply kept working hard and toiling away with no chance of ever improving their lives. If that's not evil, I don't know what is. Number six, getting married way too young. Yeah, medieval females obtained the status of married woman very early. At the age of a girl reached the age of majority and was entitled to marry. Now, in this scheme of things, the choice of her future husband was based entirely on her parents' will. No wonder marriage sanctioned by the law of the church should not be a nightmare for many wives. Under civil law, a husband was permitted to moderately physically harm his wife. Actually, a medieval tradition advised a husband to treat his wife as a pupil. So like, teach her her place. So a lot of desperate women, therefore, uh, killed their husbands. The legislation of those times had detailed regulations governing punishment for women who had killed their husbands. They were sentenced to death by burning alive or burning at the stake. Kinda like a witch. Creative, but not really. Number five, have more than 10 offspring. Yes, I know this can be a touchy subject, so just bear with me here. I'm not calling giving birth evil by any means, or having multiple offspring by choice evil. I more mean that back in the day, it was a woman's job to essentially reproduce as many offspring as possible to help around the home and to continue on the family name. As somebody who has zero interest in ever reproducing, and that is my personal choice, I have many friends who have, and I will be a fantastic aunt. The thought of giving birth once is terrifying, never mind that often. I read about a lady who had 17 offspring, and sure, while some of those might have been multiple births, I can't even imagine the pain. Or also just raising that many little ones, being responsible for that many little ones, the stress, no thank you. All the props do them, but evil because they were forced to, not because they wanted to. Number four, take up the waste. After that last one, let's start this point with a fun fact, shall we? So the British word for toilet, loo, derives from the French garder l'eau, with meaning, you know, watch out for the water. Gardez l'eau, je parle français. <laughs> this comes from the fact that, well, in medieval Europe, people simply threw the contents of their chamber pots out of the window onto the streets. Now, before throwing the waste out of the window, they'd yell, gardez l'eau. The term gardez l'eau first came to English as gardez l'eau and then shortened to loo, which eventually came to mean the toilet itself. People in the Middle Ages were no less sensitive to foul odors or disgusted by human waste than we are. They also didn't understand exactly how human waste could spread disease, but they knew it, you know, did. They just thought it was something to do with its odors. And hey, while we're on the topic of hygiene, in the early Middle Ages, women passionately cared about personal hygiene. Many townspeople took a bath, and there were a lot of bathhouses in towns. But due to the total victory of Christianity, life kind of changed. With all bathhouses being public, the church viewed it as a violation of moral standards. So then they closed them, and then untidiness was elevated to the level of virtue. Look. I'm a bit of a Christianity hater, so I'm just gonna leave that one be. Number three, V-Day traditions. So during medieval times, they believed that if a young woman ate strange food on Valentine's Day, she'd dream of her future husband. And at a time where normal meals were delicacies such as a boar's head sewed onto a turkey's body, these weird meals were, well, extra weird. The roasted hedgehog was just one of the bizarre foods that these young women would enjoy in hopes of seeing visions of their future Valentines. Yeah, okay, because that's gonna make me gag, how about we do a little palate cleanser before we move on to the next bad thing? So other sayings that were popular at the time was if you saw a blue bird, you would marry a happy man. If you see a gold finch, you're gonna marry a millionaire. And if you see a sparrow, you're marrying a poor man. If you find a glove on the road on Valentine's Day, your future beloved will have the other missing glove. Now, by the 18th century, gift giving and exchanging handmade cards had become common practice. In England, handmade cards incorporating lace and ribbon became popular. And eventually, this form of gift spread to the American colonies and into our traditions today. Also, it was found to be terrible luck to sign your name on a Valentine's Day card. And the superstition must have been very confusing for some folks, but convenient for others. As well as cards and flowers, the next gift to become popular was the giving of chocolate. Chocolates. And this can be traced back to Richard Cadbury of, yes, the famous chocolate making family, who invented the first Valentine's Day candy box. Now, as those grew in popularity, chocolate started to be given in decorated boxes filled with, you know, romantic imagery. I remember my first boyfriend got me a box back, way back when, it was a box of chocolates. I think my mom still has the box, because it was a really pretty box. Number two, institutionalized. Okay, folks, back to the icky stuff. Being sent away was a way to impose a pious life of no ownership or wealth, sexual relationships, any devotion to God, and administer health healthcare and alms to the most unfortunate in society. In reality, it didn't always work. It was a way of kings, lords, and earls banishing troublesome wives, you know, just to get them out of sight, out of mind. They could even do it to a uh, young that they didn't want to have around. Just a way of cleansing the soul, if you'd like. Hey, look, if we're looking at like the upside, a woman from aristocracy only had two options in life. Marry a man who could support you or join a nunnery. Now, virginity was an integral requirement for a nun in the very early medieval period because physical purity was considered the only starting point from which to reach spiritual purity. A nun was expected to wear simple clothing as a symbol of her shunning of worldly goods and distractions. The long tunic was typical attire, with a veil to cover all but the face as a symbol of her role as a bride of Christ. The veil also hid her hair, which had to be kept 
to cut short. Nuns cannot leave their nunnery in contact with outside visitors, especially men. That was kept to an absolute minimum. No temptation here. Granted, life isn't perfect. There was a couple of little scandals. I know there's one in mid 12th century where at the Gilbertine Watton Abbey in England, a lay brother had a sexual relationship with a nun and on discovery of the sin was castrated. It's kind of a common punishment of the period for that type of crime. Can we bring it back? Not for cheating, but for bad things. Number one, take care of the monthly visitor. As someone who's currently dealing with my regular monthly episode of cramping and being a miserable witch, how a woman had to deal with this in history before modern products is very much evil in my book. So it was very much a vastly different experience than it is today. To start, medieval women had fewer periods than today's women. Poor nutrition and hard work meant that they had very low body fat, and a woman needs to have some sort of it or her reproductive system slows down and menstruation ceases. In our modern words, for example, a medieval woman could use a makeshift, you know, pad or tampon. Pads are made of scrap fabric or rags, hence that's where the phrase came from. Cotton was preferred though, because the material absorbs fluids better than the alternative, which was wool, which is also like itchy and uncomfortable. There is some archaeological evidence to show us that some women may have worn panty-like garments, and they could also wind cotton fabric around a twig, and uh, you make of that what you will. Interesting side note though, a common type of bog moss found throughout medieval England. Now the long official name I can't say, but the popular name was B-L-O-O-D moss, and people realized that they could use it in the battlefield as first aid. So you know, put two and two together. Also, the main reason why uh, medieval petticoats came in red, it was fashionable, decorative, but it was good at disguising accidents. Number 10, Ted Kaczynski. As a young man, Kaczynski was a mathematic prodigy and at Harvard University, he underwent psychological experimentation designed to harm and humiliate subjects, which may have been part of the CIA's mind control program, aka MK Ultra, as he began to have a promising career at UC Berkeley, then suddenly resigned and retreated to the wilderness, determined to fight industrialization and the destruction of nature. Between 1978 and 1995, he mailed and delivered explosives to targets of tertiary institutions and aviation companies across the country, killing at least three people and injuring 23. The FBI dubbed him the University and Airline Bomber, leading to the nickname the Unabomber. A manhunt finally caught Kaczynski in 1996, after which he was given eight life sentences. Number 9, Henry Kissinger. Considering he was a very notable figure in American politics, his choices in regards to political American policies involving foreign affairs were extremely costly and disregarding of human life. When the Vietnam War exploded in 1955 and lasted till 1975, it had been noted that it was America's longest and most expensive war that had occurred in that era. At this time, there had been at least four noted US presidents and Henry Kissinger acted as a Secretary of State for both Nixon and Ford. In regards to the conflicts between the North and the South Vietnam over the control of which mega empire would rule, this side more in Asia, whether the USSR in the North, Americans in the South, that backing that could have technically liberated the South Vietnamese was costly as it was noted to be up to another potential $700 million. But Kissinger, despite him stating in reports he wished Congress approved his call to liberate the South Vietnamese, he happened to also make deals behind closed doors with their leaders, sacrificing them for the US POWs held hostage in the North. But also considering it was expensive and they needed oil, the Middle East were having conflicts after the Nakba that occurred in Palestine, how the colony Israel had taken over lands, and in order for the US to get oil, Kissinger had to write to Israel to release some of the lands so they could, that they colonized back to the Arab nations so that the US could get oil to continue their war in Vietnam. But the sympathy towards the South Vietnamese dwindled, not just economically but socially. When people went into the streets yelling for the government to stop funding this war, killing civilians not just the American young men forced into the war and developing PTSD later, but the hundreds of thousands of innocent Vietnamese that had also died. Kissinger had the gall to also say to President Ford in a quote, if you do that, the American people will go in the streets again, and referring to the Vietnamese, why don't those people die faster? The worst thing they can do is linger on. Yeah, he said that. As a result, the $700 million that could have liberated the South Vietnamese mysteriously was rejected by 76 congressmen into the Senate and went towards the colony Israel instead. As well as in regards to the Bangladesh Liberation War, Kissinger sneered at the people who bled for the dying Bengalis and even called Indians bastards. Mm, nice guy. Number 8, Harvey Weinstein. For sure this guy is pretty new for the history books, but he will for sure be mentioned in law books in regarding to blackmailing, coercion, and so much more messed up stuff like physically harming and harassing women and threatening their career. As a former Hollywood film producer, he became the center of a high profile criminal case that brought attention to issues of harassment and physical harm in the entertainment industry. The allegations against Weinstein were a catalyst for the Me Too movement, a social media campaign encouraging survivors of harassment and harm to come forward with their experiences. The movement shed light on the widespread issues of misconduct and 
various industries, Weinstein faced a high profile trial in New York in early 2020, and the trial included testimony from multiple women who accused him of misconduct. On February 24, 2020, Weinstein was then convicted of physical non consensual harm in the third degree and criminal act in the first degree. He was then acquitted for more serious charges, including predatory harm. Number seven, Ed Gein. Ed Gein, also known as the Butcher of Plainfield or the Plainfield Gowl, was an American killer and body snatcher who gained infamy for his gruesome crimes in the 1950s. His activities served as a partial inspiration for various fictional serial killers in books and films. Gein's crime was discovered in 1957 when police investigated the disappearance of a hardware store owner, Bernice Warden. During a search of Gein's property, they found Warden's decapitated body hanging in Gein's shed, dressed out like a deer. Dressed, like skinned. Further investigation revealed a house of horrors as Gein was a grave robber who exhumed corpses from local cemeteries. He admitted to creating a variety of items from human body parts, including clothing, furniture, and masks. Gein's gruesome artifacts shocked the public so much and fueled sensationalized media coverage, and Gein was suspected in the disappearances of two other individuals, but only two deaths were definitely linked to him, Bernice Warden, and his own brother, Henry Gein. Ed Gein was declared mentally unfit for trial and spent the rest of his life in psychiatric institutions. He was then diagnosed with schizophrenia, and his confinement included time in the Central State Hospital for the criminally insane in Wapone, Wisconsin, later in a mental health institution. He was kind of inspired for that chainsaw massacre thing as well. Number six, Clementine Barnabet. Clementine Barnabet was an American woman who gained notoriety in the early 20th century for alleged involvement in a series of death in Louisiana. Barnabet claimed to be a member of a religious cult led by her father, Raymond Barnabet, and she asserted that the cult believed in cleansing the world by killing those that seemed sinful. Between 1911 and 1912, a series of brutal axe deaths occurred in Texas and Louisiana, and Barnabet confessed to being involved in some of these killings. In 1912, Clementine was arrested along with her father, two brothers, and the connections of these deaths. She confessed to her involvement in the crimes, claiming that she and her family were carrying out God's works, killing sinners. It was a job. Bernabet confession came under scrutiny as some believed it might have been coerced or influenced by her father, but uh, there were also doubts about the accuracy of her statements. And uh, regarding the number of victims and her role in the killings, Clementine Bernabet then went to trial for her alleged. Um, Involvement in the crime. In 1913, she was found guilty and sentenced to prison, and her father and brothers were also convicted, but more of a lengthy sentence. Clementine Barnabet spent the rest of her life in prison and was never released, thankfully. And the circumstance surrounding the crime and remains a controversial and still unsolved or unresolved. Number five, Jeffrey Epstein. I know a lot of folks know this man is a greedy, nasty, rich jerk who lived in a vile organization, allowing other rich, nasty folk to take advantage of the young and vulnerable. But as the ringleader of a trafficking and harming of young women everywhere, apparently in 2008, Epstein pleaded guilty to state charges in Florida for soliciting and procuring a person under 18 for adult work, meaning under 18, young adolescents, like the age of 12 or 14. He then reached a plea deal that allowed him to avoid federal charges and served only 13 months in jail. This lenient deal orchestrated by the then US attorney Alexander Acosta later then became a subject of public scrutiny. Which as it should, considering why is the US so lenient on crimes on young people, like people that the law should protect. And then finally, 10 years later, after who knows how much more damage and crime he's committed, in July 2019, federal prosecutors in New York arrested Epstein on trafficking charges. They accused him of exploiting and abusing dozens of underage girls, and the rest following the unsealing of a new indictment, but by then 2020, somehow he died in his cell. Some say he took his own life, and others, well, when it comes to controversy, that they didn't want him to talk. After all, the nature of his relationships and the extent of his activities fueled public outrage. He wasn't alone in this, after all, he needed someone else to lure these young underage individuals, so Ghislaine Maxwell, you know her, was also charged and arrested. Investigations into Epstein's activities and the circumstances surrounding the 2008 plea deal continued. Legal action against his estate and those connected to him remain ongoing, reflecting the broader effort to seek justice for their victims. Number four, Joseph James Delangelo. Joseph James Delangelo, also known as the Golden State Killer, is an American serial killer and caused this YouTube, because I gotta be very discreet, physically violated people, if you know what I mean, who terrorized, Cal uh, who terrorized California in the 1970s and 1980s. Delangelo's crime was initially attributed to several monk cures, including East Area Harmer and Original Night Stalker, unlike Richard Ramirez, another serial killer and vile man. His crime initially began in the Sacramento area before spreading out to other parts of the state. D'Angelo modus operandi included breaking into homes, often targeting couples. I guess he was just jealous. He would tie up and harm the victims, committing non-consensual harm and then theft. In later crimes, he escalated to killings, earning him the nickname the Golden State Killer. The, the case remained unsolved for decades, but advancement in DNA technology played a crucial role in solving it. In 2018, investigators used a public ge genealogy website to identify distant relatives of the suspect and eventually led them to Joseph James D'Angelo. D'Angelo was arrested on April April 24, 2018 at his home in Citrus Heights, California, and he was identified through DNA evidence and genealogical research. At the time of his arrest, D'Angelo was also, get this, a former police officer, which added to an extra layer of shock to the case. In August 2020, D'Angelo was
was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and the sentence marking the conclusion of one of the most notorious unsolved criminal cases in US history. Number 3, Nathan Bedford Forrest. What a name. There's so many interesting names on this list. Nathan Bedford Forrest was a prominent Confederate general during the American Civil War. Unsurprisingly, given his culpability in the Ford Pillow Massacre in April 1864 and the formation of the Triple Ks, Forrest and his image may have come under attack by many sectors, especially from African Americans. The Triple Ks embarked upon a campaign of intimidation and violence against Southern blacks and Republicans until Forrest ordered the organization to disband in 1869. Nevertheless, the local chapters of the Triple Ks continued to be active and Forrest was ordered to appear before congressional hearing in 1871 and his sometimes contradictory testimony he denied he ever had membership in this organization yeah you're He's the one who had the receipt. A combination of age, exhaustion, and conversation to Christianity may have caused the Forrest's fiery temper and racial attitudes to his moderate and later years. Number two, Samuel Little. Apparently noted the most discreet but also most vile crime committing killers. The reason why he was able to get away with over killing 93 women was because of the time or the height of these deaths. Majority, if not all, of these women were women of color who worked as adult workers. And because in the 70s, law enforcement didn't prioritize people of color or the occupation of working as an adult worker, any case of missing persons from both of these factions as a cohesive was met with dismissal. So Samuel, who had a blood thirst for control and death, committed to these crimes only to these main demographics and even admitted that once he was caught at a homeless shelter in Kentucky. Originally the arrest was over narcotics, but while they tested DNA, they found the link to his crimes that were left as cold cases. And he actually memorized all of the victims that he had killed. That's crazy. Number one, Raymond Valden Lahare and John Heller. These men are hella messed up and I'm not surprised, but it's also known that, um, yeah, that's pretty much why these guys are on this list. Specifically Raymond, he was a doctor who, re who ran a research study to learn about the effects of syphilis on 400 African American men, also supposedly also 600 African men around that range. The study began in 1932 and in the 1940s the cure of syphilis was discovered in penicillin. As a result, during the experimentation, the doctors didn't tell the patients they had syphilis and didn't even give them a cure. Even some of the subjects who have heard about penicillin, so the doctors gave them sugar pills and said that they were cured when they weren't. They even prevented 50s era public health campaigns to cure syphilis from an operating in their area and they told patients that the painful spinal taps and other procedures were free treatments. They did not allow patients to see any other doctors just in case those other doctors would cure them and mess up their so called research. Many of the patients were drafted for World War II and the military wanted to cure their syphilis and recruit them, which the researchers fought as best as they were able to and the study finally ended in 1972. By that time, 128 of the men have died from syphilis and the rest have been treated by military while they were drafted. Many of the children were born with syphilis related birth defects and more than that, born dead. The last victim of this gross and horrible experiment, also known as the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study, was Ernest Hendon, who died on the 16th of January 2004. According to Fred Gray, a lawyer who represented victims of the study of the federal lawsuit, eventually in the courts as well as the study of the law of the case brought to wild attention of the three that were unethical of the study. Evidently, the rights of the research subjects were violated. The Tuskegee study raised a lot of host of ethical issues such as informed consent, racism, patronism, unfair subject selection in research, maleficence, truth telling, and and justice, among others. The gross part that even though the research helped reduce syphilis, John got an award for it despite the traumatizing things that he had done to the patients for life. Maximilian Robespierre. It is pretty well known conception when it comes to the French. Riots, p protests, and petitions and revolutions are pretty coherent. Every time the citizens of France are pissed off about something, you can guarantee they'll be on the streets and ready to go. But when did this start? Well, in 1789, when King Louis XVI needed more money, he failed to raise taxes. And when he had called a meeting with the state general, a man named Maximilien Robespierre came about after he was inspired to become a political advocate for the revolutionary cause especially since the fact that he defended the will of the people with such conviction that he was nicknamed the incorruptible at the time. But as always, when it comes to political leaders, that title can only last for so long. Because the idea and title of being such a sudden spokesperson for the people entered his head, he concluded that those who opposed him also meant opposing the people, which again wasn't true. Just because you're a spokesperson for the people doesn't mean you represent all the people. As political leaders and representatives, your role is to listen to the people even if individually they criticize you. You still need to take into consideration for effective leadership. And although we can get into the deeper details, eventually after hundreds and thousands of people died and successes of committees and policies, the Republic was still in danger as Maximilian com commented on criminals disguising themselves as patriots. In summary, the use of the guillotine was used about 16,594 times, and in the end, victims of the massacres were noted as they were caught in the crossfires of the patriotic bloodshed. In the end, his quasi-dictatorship obsession came to the end when he himself, Maximilian, was also guillotined. Number 9, Beverly Allett. 
Uh, like all ordinary people, it all starts with a specific moment in time where a switch is flipped and you no longer see yourself as the bad guy, or if there's a sense of self-awareness, maybe you do know, but you just can't stop. In the cases of Beverly Allett, she was actually always into the idea of taking care of somebody. And when she was young, she had the tendency to practice medical stuff, like play a nurse or do gauzes and cast. But it wasn't in a form of, oh, I want to learn how to be a nurse. It was more so of like, hey, I'm hurt. Can you pay attention to me kind of thing. Even to the point the obsession and desperation of being paid attention to would lure her to causing inflictions onto herself and then convince her own doctor to even remove her healthy appendix. She then left school and at 16 took a course in nursing as this was in 1968, so everyone was just doing things very early on. And as soon as she finished her course, however, she got into a hospital and in six months of hell, specifically over a period of 59 days, she would harm and kill over a dozen children. Every child under her care would suffer from cardiac arrest, chest pains, life support, and insulin overdose. The sad part was, because she was a pediatric nurse, people trusted her fully with their children, thinking she was taking care of their kids, but after staff grew skeptic of another child's death, that's when they found out she had access to drugs and eventually led to her arrest. When she was being interviewed, she apparently laughed, smiled, smirking that she wouldn't go to jail. But justice prevails, and as on May 1993, she was sentenced to life in prison. Number 8, James Patterson Smith. When it comes to toxic relationships, this is an important note that there are sources out there when you don't know if you are in one, and as well as another note, if you feel like the person has to hurt you to love you, I'm gonna tell you right now that is not what that is. Find people who care about you, and if it got physical, just call authorities. In the case of Kelly Ann Bates, she was unfortunately groomed by James Patterson Smith when she was just 14 years old. She was babysitting for friends, and Smith had an odd impact on Kelly, but what's more odd was that he was 45 years old. A 45 year old man was hitting on a 14 year old. And when Kelly tried to introduce him to her mom, she was livid and she said, Kelly, this man is bad and not a good man and hair would actually rise at the back of her mom's neck. She was right, after four weeks straight, Kelly would be tormented, harmed, attacked and be left with injuries so extensive that when they found her drowned body in the bathtub, authorities know it was something they just haven't seen before, especially how her eyes were gouged out. Prosecutors noted that the trial had in quote, it was like Smith was trying to deliberately disfigure her, causing her the utmost pain, distress and degradation. The injuries were not the result of sudden eruption of violence, but a torment that caused over time. They eventually noted that Smith was delusional and had a distorted reality with paranoia and morbid jealousy. It only took the jury only one hour to sentence the man to life. Number seven, Basil Zaharoff. When it comes to good salesmen, from what I've been told from friends who used to do door to door or did retail and the require of commissions, they always tell me that it's about human connection. And as for Basil Zaharoff, he was viewed as a master of bribery and corruption. Considered as the mystery man of Europe, you're looking at the most important people of the time when it comes to influencing the political scene in Europe with his arms deals. On both sides, he would actually sell weapons where he'd be dubbed merchant of death. He didn't care which side he was selling to, just as long as he was selling, after all, considering the current times, War is a business, not even at the expense of civilians or human life as a whole. To men like Basil, they only care about money. Even today, despite his transactions, they remain a mystery as he took up two days burning as much evidence as possible. After the First World War, he wanted more money and focused on the conflicts in Greece where he single-handedly convinced both parties between Venizelos and King Constantine to use his weapons against each other. He was basically playing Sims, but in real life. In the end, his life was shaped by seizing opportunity wherever he could find it, and through his self-serving businesses dealings, he helped shape the power dynamics of Europe and thus played an instrument part in the history of the continent. Number six, Brenda Spencer. I Don't Like Mondays is a song by Boomtown Rats and a famous quote our favorite cat, Garfield. But for the 16 year old Brenda Spencer, who the song Boomtown Rats is based off of, is one of that's very concerning. Brenda Spencer had killed two adults and wounded eight children in a sniper attack on a San Diego elementary school in 1979. The reason, she said, it was just because she didn't like Mondays. And she had a very specific color that she liked, and if you were wearing it that day, you were shot. Her parents were separated when she was young, and she was left in the custody of her dad. And her father did try to bond with her after noting she had a knack for shooting birds with a BB he took on himself to get her a semi automatic. Why? I don't know either. But he could have just taken her to like the mall or something. But apparently, according to Brenda, she said the reason why her dad got her the weapon was because she knew he, she was depressed and there was rumors that she wanted to take her own life. The morning of the event that took place is when her separated father left home and she was supposed to be at school, but it was noted by her teachers she had no interest in academics. And so she lived next to an elementary school and when she saw the children and the adults around, that's when she fired. Eventually, further casualties were reduced when the police moved a van that obscured her vicinity and she was eventually apprehended. After a deep psych valve, she was pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 25 years to life. Number five, Candence Elizabeth Newmaker. When you grew up in an unstable home, there are cases, if not most cases, especially if the child is unable to have any rehabilitation of security or sense of safety. The child, psychologically speaking, is for the lack of a better word, traumatized. After Candace Elizabeth Newmaker's parents were caught for their negligence of Candace and her siblings, Child Protective Services took her away. As a result, she was later adopted by a single woman and a pediatric nurse named Jean Elizabeth Newmaker. But after months of adoption, Candace was reacting pretty not good and she was very aggressive, according to Jean. She was even, she even killed her pet 
goldfish and started playing with matches. Keep in mind this was all under the allegation of Jean as she would also give Candace medication and take her to a psychiatrist due to her reckless behavior. In the year 2000, Jean took Candace to a pseudoscientist by the name of Cornell Watkins who didn't have a license to do a two week intensive attachment therapy program that cost $7,000. She found this so called psychiatrist from another licensed psychologist named William Goebel. After two weeks, Candace died from the so called rebirthing session and the goal of this so called rebirthing required an individual, in this case the child, to mimic a simulate womb covered by flannel sheets and pillows. Candace was held down by four adults where she was begging and pleading that she couldn't breathe. She yelled 11 times that she was dying, to which the people involved named Julie Ponder said, go ahead and die right now, for real. After 20 minutes, Candace threw up, excreted inside the sheet, and despite, they still restrained her. 40 minutes after, they asked her if she wanted to be reborn, and she responded no. They yelled at her that she was a quitter, and at the end of the session, she realized that she was motionless, her fingertips were blue, and Jean, who was watching the session from another room, took notice and tried to do CPR. They called 911, and when they were able to get a pulse, but eventually Candace died from, a, from being brain dead from asphyxia. Considering this was all videotaped, these so called therapists were sentenced to prison sentences, convicted of reckless child harm. And after that, the US House of Rep passed Candace Law in Colorado and North Carolina, preventing reenactments of the so called birth experience. Number four, Delphine LaLaurie. Delphine LaLaurie was also known as Madame LaLaurie, who was a New Orleans socialite of French Creole descent who lived in the 19th century. She was infamous for her association for one of the most notorious instances of cruel and harm in American history. So reports suggest that slaves who were owned by Delphi were found in a state of extreme physical harm and torment as reportedly chained to walls. Others were confined in small cages and others shown signs of severe mutilation. The exact details and extent of the atrocities vary in historical accounts, with some describing brutal experiments and inhumane treatment. As the news of the discovery spread, a mob of outraged citizens attacked the mansion. However, Delphi and her family managed to escape before le facing any legal consequence, of course. After leaving New Orleans, Delphi's exact fate is unclear, as there are different accounts of where she went and what happened to her. The Laurie Mansion has also been noted as a haunted house, as ghost stories and legends, as it's also considered to be one of the most haunted places in New Orleans. Number three, HJSY. If you were in Japan in the 70s, you might know this horrific and tragic story of Junko Furuta. A once motivated, popular, and beautiful high school student was headed home to watch the final episode of her favorite television show, Tonbo. When suddenly, four deviant, horrible high school boys by the name of Hiroshi Miyano, Jo Ogura, Shinji Minato, and Yashishi Watanabe adopted, adopted her and took Junko to Minato's home. There, they were extremely violent as they violated her and allowed other men to violate her as well. From the day of her kidnapping on November 25th to the day that she died on January 4th, under excruciating physical and psychological pain, she was tormented, beaded, lacerated, and even burned. Her appearance drastically deteriorated to the point where she even gave off a rotting smell. After beating and dropping an iron exercise ball on her stomach several times, burning her with hot candles and on her eyelids, forcing her to drink her own urine, Furuta succumbed to her injuries and she died. Less than 24 hours after realizing she had died, they wrapped her body in blankets, shoved her in a body and traveling bag, then placed her body in a 55 US gallon drum and filled it with wet concrete. They then dumped her body in a cement trunk in Tokyo and after they were caught and convicted for another kidnapping and physical harm to another woman, the boys accidentally confessed to the crime of Junko and told police where to find her body. She was finally found and her parents and her classmates and her co-workers found peace knowing she can finally be buried. But these horrible crappy kids were only able to get less than a 10 year sentence and even the mother of one of these horrible delinquents, Ogura, vandalized Furuta's grave saying that the dead girl ruined her son's life. Which to be honest, after these guys were released, they ended up doing more crime anyway and got arrested for that. Either way, the tragic crime of Junko Furuta had echoed as one of the most horrible crimes committed in Japan. Number two, Gamal Pasha, also known as executioner of the Armenian genocide alongside other members of the CUP. During his tenure, Jamal Pasha implemented policies that would lead to the mass deportation and killing of Armenians. He is implicated in the forced marches, massacres, and other brutal actions that resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Armenians. Pasha was also a key figure in the executions of genocidal policies set forth by the Ottoman government. And after World War I, Pasha fled the Ottoman Empire and sought refuge in Germany. In 1922, he was assassinated by an Armenian revolutionary named Telehiran. Tehilaran was later tried and acquitted by German court, which recognized the massacre of the Armenians as a war crime. So that's good to know, you know, the German court can recognize genocide as a war crime. Pasha's role in the Armenian genocide is remembered as one of the part broader historical narratives surrounding the events of 1915 and 1923, during which the Ottoman Empire systematically targeted and killed a significant portion of Armenian population. The genocide remains as a historical debate, with Turkey officially de denying the term genocide to describe these events. However, many countries and scholars around the world recognize that this was a genocide. Which, if anything, any nation that has the audacity to eradicate a nation of people by displacing them, cutting off their water, killing hundreds and thousands of their children, obliterating generations of family trees, and literally committing violence on civilians is a war crime. It is a genocide. Finally, number one, King Leopold. Although he's a king, a lot of people seem to not know that the trauma inflicted this so-called king had as a significant role in Congo. 
Congo had suffered his horrible and vicious rule as Leopold acquired control over Congo's free state as his private property during the time when European powers were competing for territories in Africa. While officially presented as a philanthropic and humanitarian venture, Leopold's administration in the Congo was marked by exploitation and brutality. From forcing them by using methods of extracting resources that were often brutal, involving the use of violence, mutilation by cutting off their hands and feet by making them also stare at their lost appendages, and forced labor of the Congolese people. The atrocities committed during this period had been well documented with the estimates of death toll ranging from several hundred thousands to millions. The harsh exploitations along with the disease introduced by outsiders led to significant decline of the people of Congo. Villages were ravaged and families were separated, contributing to the long-lasting impact of Congolese society. But was King Leopold ever accountable for his actions and his crime against the Congolese people? No, of course not. He was a European king and like all colonizers, they always seem to get away with it. Even right now, Congo is going through a massive genocide as they are forced to mine for natural resources and minerals like cobalt for your cell phones. 70% of the world's cobalt for laptops, jet engines, rockets, cameras are all from the mines in Congo. And who's mining them? Children. In 1996, over 6 million have been killed and half of them are children. As there are currently 6.9 million million people have been displaced, these crimes in Congo since Leopold still remain, and the tech industry are deeply complicit in the injustices in Congo. Number 10, Stubbins Firth. Stubbins Firth was a University of Pennsylvania researcher fixated on one particular scientific scheme and a very dangerous one at that. As a trainee doctor, he became obsessed with the idea that yellow fever was non-contagious, to the extent that he went to great extremes trying to prove it. Armed only with a trusty blade and his incessant desire to find the truth, first sliced, opened his arms, and smeared vomit from yellow fever patients into his wounds. When that made no difference, he poured the vomit into his eyes, drank some of it, fried the stuff, and breathed in the fumes. And in a final act of madness, he covered himself with blood, urine, and saliva from infected patients. Ultimately, Firth proved this theory so far as he didn't get sick. However, we now know that this was as much down to him making samples from the late stage patients who were past the point of contagion. In other words, Firth swallowed infected vomit but didn't shred much new light on the disease. So he did all that. For nothing. Number 9, Jose Delgado. University of Madrid graduate Jose Delgado may have received a prestigious professorship at Yale University, but his research was on dealing with mind control. While at Yale in the 50s, 60s, Delgado inserted electrode implants into the brains of primates and used a remote control that gave off radio frequencies to make the animals perform complicated movements. Later, he placed the implants into the brain of a bull and got into the ring with the beast using his transmitter to stop charging before it reached him. Aside the animal cruelty, he even tried these experiments on 25 people and wired them up. Behaviorally, it only induced the people's anger and impacted more towards their aggression, but he kept striving for a way to achieve mind control and even once said, we must electronically control the brain and someday armies and generals will be controlled by electric stimulation of the brain. I don't know, I guess it doesn't work. Number 8, Paracelsus. Switzerland Paracelsus' contributions to taxology were based heavily in astrology and he is quite no well known for offering the community a wide array of useful ideas and innovations. He was a pioneer in several aspects of the medical revolutions of the Renaissance, emphasizing the value of observation in combination with received wisdom. However, for all of his use, he also thought he might be able to create a homunculi, or small humans, who stood no more than a foot or so height and performed actions very similar to Gollum. Not Gollum from Lord of the Rings, but pretty close. He is said to have run away after turning on their master. The homunculus creation used bits of people using semen and hair. To him, the fully grown homunculi was supposedly greatly skilled in art and could create giants, dwarves, and other marvels. As though they are art, they are born, and therefore art is embodied and inborn in them. And they needed to learn it from, well, no one. Well, it didn't end up working because they ended up dying uh, right away. Number seven, Peter Nobor. Clinical psychologists led by Peter Nobor ran a secret experiment in which they separated twins and triplets from each other. And adopted them out as singlets. The experiment, said to have been partly funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, came into light when three identical triplet brothers accidentally found each other in 1980. They had no idea they had siblings, and David Kelman, one of the triplets, felt really angry towards the experiment, quoting, We were robbed of 20 years together, said Kelman in the Orlando Sentinel article. His brother, Edward Gallen, sadly took his own life in 1995 at his home. The child psychiatrist who headed up the study, Peter Nober and Viola Bernard, showed no remorse, according to news reports, going as far as saying they thought that they were doing something good for the kids, separating them so that they could develop their own individual personalities. As Frau Norbert learned from his evil experiment that anyone's guess as a result of the controversial study are being stored in an archive at Yale University, and they say they can't actually reveal it until 2066. Number 6, the Burke and Hare. Body snatching was very common in the ages of the pre-19th century, as the only legal way to get bodies for dissection was those of executed criminals. Since it was difficult to get on the waiting list for these bodies, anatomists took burying bodies from the grave, robbers, or even doing it themselves. Up until 
until the students and the anatomists would carry out their own raids in graveyards, acquiring cadavers as and what they could. William Hare and his friends William Burke found ways of delivering fresh corpses to their boarding houses without actually having to steal a body, which is that they would smother more than a dozen lodgers at that boarding house. And then they would sell their bodies to the anatomist Robert Knox. And Knox didn't notice or care that the bodies that he received were recently fresh, as it was imperative to his job. Burke was later charged and died for his crimes, and the case spurred the British government to loosen the restrictions on dissection. The scandal led to the Anatomy Act of 1832, where they made a great number of cadavers legally available for education purposes. Typically, these bodies would be from those who died in an asylum and had no relatives or any ways to cover for funeral costs. Number 5. Sidney Gottlieb Gottlieb was in charge of the CIA's MK Ultra project in the 1950s. This project's goal was to investigate techniques that would crush the human psyche to the point that it would admit to anything. I guess in some ways, it's kind of like the truth serum, but with psychology. More specifically, he too also wanted to find a way to do mind control like Delgado in number 9. He wanted to find ways with the CIA to induce the behaviors of enemies, but in these cases, Sidney went his way to buy dosing unsuspecting subjects with LSD, experimenting with illegal drugs, and sought out all sorts of exciting ways to poison people, including Fidel Castro, as he is the man behind the infamous poison cigar. If you guys know Stranger Things, the suspicion of Eleven getting her powers was from her mom being induced with LSD chemicals that were thought to be creating of powerful abilities, but unlike Stranger Things, it definitely helped open someone's mind up, but not like moving stuff with one's mind. Number 4. Sergei Burko Honeko Although he's been credited with helping bring about the most important advances with open heart surgery, his gruesome act was at on experimentations on animals, also animal cruelty. Sergei wasn't content with slicing up animals after they died, more specifically not only did he not like to wait, but he also didn't like the animals to die, even after they've been decapitated. In the late 1930s, him and his team undertook a series of experiments as part of which they removed a canine's head and kept it alive away from its body by hooking it up to an air and blood supply apparatus. He would also have another hound had all the blood drawn from its body only later to be brought back to life by the Soviet Frankenstein. Number 3. Shiro Ishii A microbiologist and a lieutenant general of Unit 731, a biological warfare unit of the Imperial Japanese Army during the Second Sino-Japanese War. Ishii is remembered as the father of biological warfare. Under his watch, thousands of captives were infected with deadly diseases and thousands more were impacted by chemicals on the battlefield. Ishii performed a bunch of experiments that had nothing to do with chemical warfare including force of actions, vivisections, and simulated strokes. Huh. Humans were also used as a living test cases for grenades and flamethrowers, and prisoners were injected with inoculations of diseases disguised as vaccinations to study their effects. Because life is totally fair, Ishii was never charged with war crimes, and he died peacefully at his home in Japan in the late 60s. Number 2. Joseph Mengele Mengele gained notoriety chiefly for being one of the SS physicians who supervised the selections of arriving transports of prisoners, determining who was to be killed and who was to become a forced laborer, and for performing human experiments on camp inmates, amongst whom Mengele was known as the Angel of Death. Mengele was just a stone cold killer as he performed experiments on 3,000 sets of twins and less than 30 survived his depraved antics. His experiments included but sadly were not limited to dyeing children's eyes to be a specific color since he has an obsession with monochromatic eyes, sewing twins together to make them conjoined, and giving them gangrene. In fact, many of his evil deeds weren't scientific at all. He was just masochistic. He was reportedly smiling every time he took part of his selection process of sending arrivals at camps on who were unfit for labor straight to the gas chambers. He died in 1976 and as he was never brought to justice for his crimes. Number 1. J. Marion Sims Although he was known as the father of modern gynecology, Sims was gained much for his fame for doing experimental surgeries on slave women. Sims remained a controversial figure to this day because the condition he was treating the women, visco genital fistula, caused terrible suffering. Women with fistulas, a tear between their private parts and their bladder, were incontent and were often rejected by society. Sims performed the surgery without anesthesia, in part because anesthesia had only recently been discovered, and in part because Sims believed that operations were not painful enough to justify the trouble, which is what he said, but still regardless, the cruelty he bestowed on these women were not at all consented and manipulated the social institutions on slavery to perform human experiments, which by any standards is unacceptable. It might be too clever to talk about Lizzie Borden as a pun, but I'll ask you guys about that later. <laughs> Sorry. Anyways, Lizzie Borden was an American woman who was tried and then later acquitted for the axe murderers of her father and stepmother in Massachusetts. Lizzie was very religious and would go to church and do church activities, teaching Sunday school, etc, etc. Three years later, after her mother passed away, her father remarried to Abby Gray. Lizzie didn't like Abby that much because she suspected Abby's goal was her father's money, and as tensions grew even more when Andrew would gift real estate to his new family's wife and their stepmother received a house. The night before the murder, their uncle visited their father to discuss property transfer, which placed more tension. After
After the crime was committed, the police turned their attention to Lizzie as she gave conflicting testimonies within the day. And after many, many strange occurrences, like her cleaning her dress and burning it up, saying it was covered in paint, the town's suspicion of her drugging her father to sleep in order to whack him with an axe, overall the evidence was unclear and caused many controversial issues. However, the trial was later pushed away when another axe murderer, similar to her father and her stepmom's case, occurred five days prior. Still, the reputation of Lizzie and her sister's involvement was tarnished, and the suspecting evidence and accounts of that day remains unsolved. Number 9. Elsa Koch Elsa Koch was a German war criminal who committed atrocities while her husband, Karl Otto Koch, was commanded at the Bolchenwald in World War II. Because of the egregiousness of her alleged allegations and her actions included that she had selected tattooed prisoners for death in order to fashionably create lampshades and other items from their skin. I don't, these are fake, by the way, they're not real. Her 1947 U.S. Military Commission court trial at Dachau received worldwide media attention, as did the testimony of survivors who ascribed her sadistic and perverse acts of violence to Koch, giving rise to her image as her concentration camp murderesses. However, authoritative testimony from numerous witnesses at her post war trials firmly established that she had made extensive use of slave labor at the camp, had assaulted inmates on several occasions, and had reported inmates to the camp SS for beatings. Beatings that resulted in death on at least one occasion while imprisoned, she experienced delusions and had become convinced that the concentration camp survivors would abuse her in the cell. She then ended up taking her own life in jail while serving time. Number 8. Belle Gunness With an estimated 48 deaths at her hand, Belle Gunness poisoned, bludgeoned, and decapitated her victims, all so that she could collect and line her pockets with savings and insurance policies. This lonely hearts killer was known as Lady Bluebeard, amongst other names, luring her victims with newspaper advertisements. Gunness then began meeting wealthy men through a lovelorn column. Her suitors were her next victims, each of whom brought cash to her farm and then disappeared forever, including John Moo, Henry Galthard, Olaf, Oli B, Andrew, just to name a few. One of the victim's brothers came suspicious, and Gunness's luck seems to be running out. Her farmhouse burnt to the ground, and the smoldering ruins workmen discovered four skeletons. Three were identified as her foster young. However, the fourth, believed to be Gunness, was unexpectedly missing as its skull. After the fire, her victims were unearthed from their shallow graves around the farm, all told the remains of more than 40 men and miners were exhumed. However, Belle managed to skip out of town before being officially convicted and was never tracked down. Her death has never been confirmed. Number 7. Countess Elizabeth Bathory I don't know if you've seen the tales of Snow White and how there was this once evil queen who yearned for eternal beauty, but like all fairy tales come from the stem of truth. Countess Elizabeth Bathory was a Hungarian noblewoman who was an alleged serial killer from the family Bathory, who owned a land in the Kingdom of Hungary. Bathory and four of her servants were accused of torturing and killing hundreds of young and old women between 1590 and 1610. During her arrest, it is commonly believed that Bathory was caught in the act of the torture, but the reality was that she was just having dinner. Most of the witnesses testified that she had heard the accusation from others, but did not actually see it themselves. The servants confessed under torture, which is not credible in contemporary proceedings. The accusations of the murder were based on rumors, and as there is no documents to prove that anyone in the area complained about the Countess, in this time period, if someone was harmed or let's say someone stole something, a letter would be written out as a complaint. Several authors have argued that Elizabeth Bathory was a victim of conspiracy. Similar, during the Salem witch trials, many people insisted that they saw the accused witches of flying through the sky. Clearly, neither thing happened and are possibly a form of mass delusion or self interest lies. Historians are therefore extremely careful in how they treat eyewitness accounts of this sort, given the possibility for collective and self reinforcing delusions. Number 6. Dorothea Helen Puente Dorothea Helen Puente was an American convicted serial killer, and in the 1980s, she ran a boarding house in Sacramento, California, and murdered very various elderly and mentally disabled boarders before cashing their social security checks. She paid each of them monthly spendies, but then kept the remaining for what she claimed were expenses for the boarding house. Puente's boarding house was visited by several parole agents as a result of previous orders for her to stay away from the elderly people and not to handle government checks. Despite these frequent visits, she was never charged with anything. Neighbors began to grow suspicious of Puente when she said that she adopted a homeless man uh, named Chief to serve as a handyman. She had Chief dig the basement and remove soil and garbage from the property, and Chief then then put in a newly concrete slab in the basement before he too mysteriously disappeared. In November 1988, another tenant in Puente's house, Alvaro Montoya, disappeared, and after he failed to show up for his meetings, his social worker reported him missing. Police arrived at Puente's boarding house and began to search the property. They discovered recently disturbed soil and were able to uncover seven bodies in the yard. When the investigation began, Puente was not considered a suspect, and as soon as the police let her out of their sight, she basically fled to Los Angeles where she visited a bar and began to talk to an elderly pension. Engineer. The man recognized her from the news and then he called the police and she was charged with nine counts of murder and was sentenced to two years of life. She died at the age of 82 and had always insisted all of her tenants died to natural death. 
Number 5, Julia Tofana. Not your typical Chanel number 5, but this too was a femme fatale bottle used by so many women to do one major thing, to get rid of their husbands. By some definitions, Julia was a girl's girl. After all, it was the 1600s, and women who had malignant husbands who would physically harm and control them was a rather common issue, and the general rule was that unless your spouse passed away, that was the only time a woman could be granted her freedom. In its creation was associated by none other than Julia Tofana, who apparently was the ringleader of six poisoners in Rome. In order to avoid detection from authorities, they actually used the trade name after St. Nicholas and would sell the poison openly as a cosmetic. They even went ahead and used an image of St. Nicholas over the vials, and St. Nicholas and the vial of poison would be sold, affecting over 600 victims, mostly husbands. The active contents inside the vial was unknown, but it was filled with arsenic, lead, and possibly belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and therefore very easy to mix with other substances like wine or water. The poisoning would go unnoticed, and its symptoms would mimic other illnesses that was prominent at the time. First dosage would mimic a cold, the third would be digestive issues, and the fourth was death. It was so effective and helpful that when the poison was used to be in its slow active state, it would give the victims time to assume that they were dying and write a will. And if the provider of the poison changed their mind, an antidote was simply lemon juice and vinegar. Fun fact, Mozart at one point was poisoned using aqua tofana, but apparently he himself started this rumor. And if you knew anything about Mozart, he was the Bugs Bunny level type of troll. Number 4, Bonnie Nettles. As cult leaders go, most women of cult leaders were subject to follow their male counterparts. As for Bonnie Nettles, she was the co-founder and co-leader with Marshall Applewhite of the Heaven's Gate New Religion movement. Although she was registered as a nurse and was married to a businessman named Joseph Nettles, she actually lived a relatively normal life. However, according to the New York Times, she began attempting to contact deceased spirits by conducting regular seances and came to believe that the 19th century monk named Brother Francis frequently spoke with her and gave her instructions. She also visited multiple fortune tellers who told her that she would soon meet a mysterious man who was tall with light hair and fair complexion, descriptions that were very close to Marshall Applewhite's appearance. It was unclear how they met, but after Nettles did an astrological reading for Applewhite, they had an instant spiritual connection. Nettles and Applewhite established Heaven's Gate together as equals, with Nettles running the group and Applewhite speaking for her. Nettles claimed to have communicated with aliens about the next level and told Applewhite to tell their followers. When Nettles died from cancer, the mass followers of Heaven's Gates would then follow through by cultivating to take their own lives in 1997. Number 3, Eileen Wernos. On a bit recent note, you may or may not have heard in this case in the news, but Eileen Wernos was a convicted serial killer as she targeted only men as an adult worker. She had up to 7 victims and would target specifically motorists, men who she would meet as a hitchhiker. Her story begins when her mother at the age of 14 married her father at the age of 19. After 2 months of having Eileen, her parents divorced and left her with her alcoholic grandparents who were also malicious in their care. Eileen would then do adult work as a minor once her grandfather kicked her out to live in the woods at the age of 15 and she tried to take her own life multiple times, all failed attempts, and until she met the love of her life Tyra Moore in the late 80s is when she would continue a string of crime. While she was incarcerated at the Florida Department of Corrections BCI death row for women, she tried to appeal to the US Supreme Court, which was later denied, and at that point she dismissed her legal counsel and terminated all pending appeals. She would then go off and say, I killed those men, I robbed them cold as ice, and I'd do it again too, there's no chance in keeping me alive or anything, because I'd kill again. I have hate crawling through my system, I'm so sick of this she's crazy stuff, I've been evaluated so many times, I'm competent, sane, and I'm trying to tell the truth. I'm one who seriously hates human life and would kill again. After extreme mistreatments she suffered while imprisoned and the inhumane management given to her by her officers, in her final interview she turned to the interviewer and said, and also paraphrasing due to censorship, you sabotaged me society and the cops and the system, an attacked woman got executed and was used for books and movies and so on. Her final on camera words were, thanks a lot society for railroading my ass. She was later executed by lethal injection. Number 2, Pearl Fernandez. Again, although this case is one of a very recent event, it still marks as a notable case in the issues that lie in the legal forms, in the protections of minors, and the lack of involvement of CPS. Pearl Fernandez, you may or may not know, was the mother of Gabriel Fernandez, who passed away in Pearl and her boyfriend Usaro's custody. According to The Atlantic, Pearl Fernandez and her boyfriend shot Gabriel with a BB gun, tortured him with pepper spray, beat him with a baseball bat, and forced him to eat cat feces. All injuries pointed to severe psychological and emotional distress endured over a long period of time. It was not one time event that led to Gabriel's death, it was months of torture. A judge rejected her remorse, stating that Pearl's actions were horrendous and inhumane and nothing short of evil. At her trial, jurors heard how Gabriel was tortured and abused by his mother and her boyfriend after being placed in their care eight months before his death. Pearl is now serving time at the Central California Women's Facility after being sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Number 1, Jolly Jane. While she definitely was jolly when she committed these crimes, Jane Toppin, nicknamed Jolly Jane, was an American serial killer who was known to have committed 12 murders in Massachusetts between 18 and 1901. How did she commit these? Well, she was a nurse, 
and her objective was oddly enough to target patients and their family members. Doctors who hired her thought of her as one of their best nurses, but today psychiatrists say that she was one of the most unusual serial killers in history. She was born and raised in the Boston Female Asylum, where unwanted female children were often abandoned. There she was adopted by Anne Toppin, where she was under foster care until she was 18. At this point, she then pursued nursing at Cambridge Hospital in Boston. It was here where she stated her interest in the patients was ought to be taken care of. She grew emotional attachments to them, and if she really liked them, she would fake their medical documents to force them to stay longer at the hospital. She would then also dose her elderly patients with opium to see how they react with the drugs, and then upping the dosage each time. She would also watch them slowly succumb to their death, and she would also mix different types of poisons with her patients and other drugs to stage a sickness and nurse them back to health. Very similar to the Gypsy Rose Blanchard case where her mother Dee Dee had a mental illness known as Munch Austin syndrome by proxy. This mental health condition is basically where a caregiver makes up or causes an illness or injury in a person under their care, such as the young or the elderly adult, or a person who has a disability. Because vulnerable people are the victims, MSBP is a form of multiple harm cases. Jolly Jane also had a masochistic side, as she would even get into the bed of her patients who were suffering until they died. She wasn't caught until she used a metallic-based poison on a victim, which finally sparked an investigation in a court 1902. Topan was found guilty, and then she told her attorney that she actually killed more than 100 people, and even got in beds with more of her victims. She was sentenced to stay at an asylum, stayed there until her death. Number 10. The Donovan Family Ouija Board In the eerie case of the Donovan household, we witnessed the harrowing consequences of uh, dabbling with the supernatural. Patty Donovan's innocent curiosity led her down a treacherous path when she engaged with, yep, a Ouija board, the thing I hate the most, believing she had found a friend in a spirit. As she grew emotionally dependent on this entity, the disturbing incidents began to unfold. The malevolent spirit, once her confidant or boyfriend, turned into a malevolent force, turned into quite the force wreaking havoc on her family. It targeted their vehicles, disassembling engines and puncturing tires, leaving them vulnerable and stranded. The spirit's actions escalated with vandalism around their home and inexplicable damage to their property, even to the point of furniture levitating and rocks raining down on their house. It's kind of baffling that the family didn't connect the dots sooner, seeing as the signs of, you know, chaos became increasingly apparent and obvious. Her dad, Ted Donovan's desperation, led him to seek help from our favorite paranormal investigators, Ed and Lorraine Warren. Upon their arrival, they sensed a pervasive malevolence within the home, and the family's history with the Ouija board was finally revealed. The Warrens, realizing the gravity of the situation, initiated the process for an exorcism, which took a painfully long month to be granted. In the meantime, the entire family endured more torment and destruction at the hands of the malevolent entities. Finally, on May 2nd, the exorcism took place, liberating the family from their demonic ordeal. However, they were left with a substantial financial burden due to the extensive damages inflicted upon their home. Let this be a lesson to you all. Please, please, please leave Ouija boards alone. Please. Number 9. The Woodruff Family So this incident happened in St. Francisville, Louisiana, and in a home built in 1796 by General David Bradford on top of a formal burial ground, so um, brace yourselves! Our story begins with a newly married couple, Mr. and Mrs. Clark Woodruff. Mr. Woodruff was a cruel and harmful man and owned numerous slaves, which was the icky norm at the time, and one in particular that he liked to um, punish went by the name of Chloe. Now, Chloe tried to protect herself from the wrongful punishments by listening in on the Woodruff's conversations and modifying her behavior, which Hey, that's brilliant. Sadly though, one day after being caught eavesdropping, Clark had one of Chloe's ears cut off. The painful experience would stay with Chloe and inspire her to make plans for revenge. On the ninth birthday of the Woodruff's daughter, Chloe placed poisonous oleander leaves into the cake, intending to only get the family sick so she could nurse them back to health and, uh, you know, earn a favor with the family. Tragically, the dose was lethal, and it ended up killing the misses and the offspring. Now, while Chloe was punished fatally by the other slaves and her ghost haunts the home, the mirror in the front hall is cursed and has the spirits of Sarah and her two descendants descendants trapped inside of it. People who look into the mirror ever since have reported feeling a sense of dread that stays with them past their visit, you know, experiencing horrid thoughts and more. Look, I'm on Team Smash the Thing, even though I know that would technically make the world worse. So maybe just stick it in a closet somewhere, because it's just wreck because it's just messing with every other family. Number eight, Annabelle. Am I biased because Annabelle has always been my favorite demonic artifact? Absolutely I am. Donna and Angie were student nurses and good friends who had decided to room together while in school. And for Donna's 28th birthday, her mom had gifted her a very large Riggedy Ann doll, something she was thrilled about. Hey, personally, I'd react the same way. Let the record know that I'm always down to accept gifts of dolls or plushies. Soon after adopting the precious doll though, Donna started to notice some weird behavior. She would leave Annabelle on her bed every morning behind her locked bedroom door, seeing her the same way with her 
her arms and legs crossed, and would come home at night to Annabelle having moved rooms and in positions that um, weren't possible. She's described a few instances of the doll kneeling, and speaking from experience, stuffed dolls can't kneel without falling for more than like a few seconds. Donna and Angie then started finding notes left throughout the apartment, written on parchment paper in red pen, two things they um, didn't own. When Donna's boyfriend Lou started criticizing the doll, unexplainable handprints and scratches began appearing on his body. And that's when the girls made the decision to call the priest, who then brought in Ed and Lorraine Warren. They were able to calm down the entity enough to remove it from the home and transport her to the museum, where she resides to this day, but not without a couple of um, chaos events over the years. Number 7. Robert the Evil Doll Hey, for starters, this doll only looks vaguely human. His nub of a nose looks like a pair of pinholes, and he's covered in brown little nicks, like scars. His eyes are beady and black, and combined with his malevolent and smirk, it's terrifying to look at. Clasped in his lap, he's holding his own toy, a dog with disproportionate eyes and a too big tongue falling out of its mouth. The doll originally belonged to Robert Eugene Otto, an artist described as, well, eccentric. Neighbors of Robert used to hear him having a conversation with the doll, and this continued into his adult years. He brought it everywhere, and talked about it in the first person as if it weren't a doll, which I know, might sound kind of batty. But it's the best way to deal with cursed objects. Trust me, I'm talking from experience. The doll remained stored in the Otto family home until Robert passed away in 1974. After his death, a couple bought the house, and their eight year old found the doll in the attic. The young girl often claimed that the doll was trying to kill her, and it's now on display in a museum in Key West and is still believed to curse people. His last caretaker before the museum experienced him disappear and reappear as he pleased, along with hearing footsteps and giggling in the attic. Some claimed Robert's expression changed when anybody badmouthed Otto in his presence. Oh, and um, he's been responsible for a few car crashes, some divorces, and broken bones. So uh, good Robert, good doll, please, I don't need to be cursed. My life's crazy enough as it is. Number 6. Another Ouija board incident The story of Mark and his family's eerie encounter with a cursed Ouija board infested home in Australia is nothing short of a supernatural roller coaster. At first, you know, subtle signs emerged, like their dog's reluctance to enter the house, which was dismissed as, you know, a mere adjustment to the new environment. But things quickly escalated. Mysterious flooding in the laundry room, shattered light bulbs, and an overwhelming sense of unease in certain areas of the house signaled something far more sinister. The disembodied laughter, shuffling feet, and phantom voices only intensified their torment. Even visiting relatives experienced the unnerving phenomena firsthand. What's truly chilling is the revelation about the previous renter's involvement in seances and a messy divorce, possibly leaving behind a trail of spiritual chaos. You know, possibly. Maybe. Mark's mother's decision to consult a local pastor led to a grim revelation of multiple demonic entities lurking in their home. As the supernatural disturbances grew unbearable, the family decided to take action. The mom's brave confrontation with the paranormal, you know, reading Bible verses aloud, was met with the spirit's fury, resulting in potential poltergeist activity. The climax of this terrifying tale came when the youngest member of the family miraculously survived a fall from an open window. This event was the final straw, prompting them to flee the cursed house without looking back. Once again, not to sound like a broken record. Leave Ouija boards alone, please. Number 5. A Cursed Painting Technically, this item cursed enough households to be a top 10 list of its own, which is a nightmare for my brain. The tale of the crying boy painting is a chilling example of the inexplicable, a bizarre intersection of art and the supernatural that unfolded in the 1970s and 1980s. Bob Smith's childhood fascination with the seemingly, you know, innocent painting turned into a haunting mystery when a kitchen fire devastated his grandmother's house, leaving only the painting unscathed. The eerie connection deepened when Bob later learned that the very same painting had caused similar tragedies in other households. Giovanni Bregolin's series of paintings, of which which the crime boy was a part, became notorious. In 1985, the Sun newspaper in the UK published a shocking account of May and Ron Hall, whose home was consumed by fire, with only the cursed painting surviving unharmed. What's truly unsettling is the firefighter's claim that he had witnessed multiple house fires where everything was reduced to ashes except for copies of The Crying Boy. The widespread reports of similar incidents fueled the belief in the painting's curse, leading to a wave of fear and destruction. Ultimately, the Sun's bonfire of these paintings marked the end of their popularity, but a few copies still linger carrying with them the ominous aura of the inexplicable. So um, if you have one, burn it. Number 4. A Conjuring Book In this perplexing case, the Foster family found themselves entangled with quite the evil artifact. Yep, a book to conjure evil things that, uh, if you haven't guessed it already, brought malevolent forces into their home. The eerie events began when Lorraine Warren received a mysterious call from a Mrs. Sandy Foster in the middle of the night, only to have the phone connection mysteriously severed. The following day, Lorraine visited the Fosters and learned of the disturbing occurrences plaguing their household. Meg, the daughter, had unwittingly invited dark spirits by dabbling in the occult, and the family experienced a series of terrifying events. I'm talking the classic, faucets turned on by themselves, phantom footsteps echoed throughout the house, and strange lights and sounds plagued their nights. So go ahead Lorraine, they stepped in to confront the menacing presence. They discovered that Meg's bedroom was a hub of occult activities. They discovered that Meg's bedroom was quite the hub of occult activities, containing black conjuring candles, occult vestments, and ritual books. 
Rut Row. They sealed the room, removing the sinister artifacts, and as they worked to dispel the evil, they encountered a chilling telepathic feeling of dread and an inexplicable force preventing them from ascending any kind of stairs. Despite these challenges, Ed and Lorraine persevered. With holy water and prayers, they successfully cleansed the house of the malevolent entities. The case serves as a haunting reminder of the dangers of dabbling in the occult and potential consequences of summoning forces beyond human comprehension. See? I told y'all. Don't summon beings. Number 3. The Snedeker Family Rosary Beads As you might have expected, this true story begins in the witching hour, in the wee small hours of the morning. One night, very very late at night, Ed and Lorraine were contacted by the family, who had just moved into a house on Meriden Avenue in Southington. Specifically, the mother of the family unit and a niece who came to stay with the family were on the phone. What they found and thought they bought was a big and seemingly welcoming home, but what they didn't know was that it was a former funeral home. Oh and fun fact, the morticians at the funeral home were allegedly involved in necrophilia, or performing um… Schmeck's acts with corpses. What used to be the showroom for the coffins was now the young person's room, you know, and uh, oh, just down the hall from that? The place where the bodies were prepared for viewing. So the young boys were the first to start talking about the things that they had seen and experienced, saying they were terrified, and the parents chastised them at first for it, but they were so scared they started sleeping on the floor in the living room. Among the sounds the boys would hear were the sound of uh, chains pulling the coffin upstairs. Only thing was, there was no more coffins. So the woman who called the Warrens were terrified, and with the niece in a small bedroom in the back of the house, and the covers on her bed were uh, levitating around her, like there was a fan blowing them around. You know, no big. And Lorraine said that while the mom was on the phone with her, even more bizarre events started happening. The mother had rosary beads in her hand, and while she spoke, the beads were actually being pulled apart and falling to the floor. So Ed and Lorraine went over the next morning with the family's parish priest. A blessing of the house seemed to do nothing to calm things down, so that's when the Warrens decided to call the bishop's office. Eventually sent an exorcist, which seemed to do the trick. But not before one last hurrah from whatever was believed to be haunting the house, because demons don't like to give up without a fight. There was a huge tree in front of the house, and half of the tree, with no wind, broke off and fell on the property. The family moved a short time later, and Ed and Lorraine kept the rosary beads that had been pulled apart, because if a demonic spirit can touch a catholic relic, that's just a really bad thing. Number 2. Bathsheba's Jewelry Box Soon after the Peron family moved into what they thought was a really fun home, strange occurrences began to unravel, initially dismissed as minor inconveniences. We're talking brooms moved on their own, and the young daughters started seeing apparitions. Carolyn Peron, determined to uncover the truth, delved into the history of the house and discovered a lineage plagued by mysterious and tragic deaths spanning eight generations. The most ominous presence was that of Bathsheba Sherman, a woman associated with witchcraft. Bathsheba's malevolent intentions became evident as the family's life spiraled into a nightmare. One harrowing incident involved Carolyn experiencing an inexplicable puncture wound on her calf, resembling a large sewing needle impalement. This unsettling occurrence was just one of the many tormenting episodes endured by the Piron family over their decade-long residency in the house. Thankfully, the Warrens got summoned to help the family, and they identified a cursed artifact, a mysterious box, which they believed acted as a conduit for the evil energy afflicting the household. So they took it with them. End of story. Thank goodness. Number 1. Don't open the box In Jewish folklore, a dibuk is an evil spirit. Supposedly, a Holocaust survivor accidentally summoned the demon while using a homemade Ouija board, but managed to trap it inside a wine cabinet. Kevin Manis bought the box at an estate sale in 2001 and immediately started having nightmares about an evil hag, ditto for the friends who stayed with him. He gave the box to his mom, who suffered a stroke on the same day, and later owners have also claimed that uh, the scary thing has appeared in their nightmares as well. Thankfully, at some point, the owner contacted local rabbis, sealed the demon back in the box, and then hid it from the world. Thank goodness. 